Hello and good evening to you all. Welcome to the another session of Daily News Simplified. And as you know, we have taken up important news and article from the Hindu and Indian Express newspaper dated 27th November 2023, New Delhi edition. And as per the practice, uh, we have segregated the discussion into two parts, that is prelims and mains. For prelims, we have four topics and uh, the first topic, as you all know, today is birth anniversary of Guru Nanak Dev Ji. So, from Rao's IS, we extend our warm wishes on this auspicious occasion. And we have taken up a question based on Guru Nanak Dev Ji. Second question is based on a news event which happened in Bandipur, Karnataka. Here, uh, forest officials are upping their game up to track a tiger who recently killed a woman. Okay. So, third topic for prelims discussion is based on piezoelectric effect, which featured on the science section of the Hindu newspaper. So, we have taken up an MCQ and through that we will understand what is it. Then, another prelims uh, question is based on this news article, uh, which which is based on the special mention accounts. And now recently a report came which highlighted that uh, what is the burden of uh, these special mention accounts uh, regarding the unsecured loans in Indian banking system. For mains discussion on the occasion of Constitution Day, our president reiterated the demand for all India judicial services. Fine. So, we will take up this topic from the perspective of mains examination. Apart from that, government is, has uh, renamed one of the component of Ayushman Bharat Health Scheme. So, we will be covering Ayushman Bharat Scheme also. So, let us begin our discussion. And as we discuss, there were several ads which featured and they were extending their greetings towards this Prakash Utsa or Gurpura. So, UPSC as you know has been asking question based on Bhakti movement and one can easily say that uh, one of the most prominent saint from that movement that is Bhakti movement who emerged from that movement is Guru Nanak Dev Ji. So, before taking up the question, we will take some key information, we will uh, look into some key facts related to Guru Nanak Dev Ji. And then we will move on to take up the question. So, he was founder of the Sikh religion, as you all know. He was a prominent saint who greatly appreciated the teaching of Kabir, another Bhakti saint. Guru Nanak was born at uh, village Talwandi near Lahore in the year 9, 1469. His beliefs include that uh, he believed that the married life and secular business did not obstruct the spiritual progress and emancipation of man. So, you don't need to renounce the family, okay? Because according to him, married life and uh, secular business, uh, they do not obstruct the spiritual progress of a person, fine? Thirdly, he said that Guru, uh, he led much impress on the oneness of God as truth and fraternity of men righteous living and the social virtues of dignity of labor and charity. Fine. Further, he believed in God as the omnipotent reality and the human soul could attain union with him through love and devotion, which is the basic proponent of entire bhakti movement. That there should be uh, no bars of or the compulsions of rituals. Okay. There should be no compulsion and then there should be no intermediary between you and God. So, through love and devotion, one can attain the salvation or the reach out to the God. So, this is same as that was the prominent theme of the Bhakti movement. So, as he said that not by knowledge of ceremonial observance. Okay. Nanak preached in the language of the people. Okay, as was true with the, all the bhakti saints that they used vernacular language which made, uh, which was helpful in uh, further expansion of bhakti movement in India. 
Okay. So, on the similar line, he preached in the language of the people and his preachings become very popular during his lifetime itself. His disciples included both Hindus and Muslims. He decried caste system and challenged the monopoly of his spiritual evolution and religious sanctity of higher castes. Fine. So, these were some important information related to Guru Nanak Dev Ji. Now, let's uh, move on to take the question. And as you know, in 2019, UPSC asked question based on St. Nimbark, Kabir, and Sheikh Ahmad Sarhindi. Okay. So, we have taken up a question based on Sikhism. You have to identify the correct statement. And a statement one says, Gurumukhi script was introduced by Guru Nanak in which he wrote his religious teachings. Now, this statement is incorrect. As uh, Guru Nanak, uh, they have chose uh, Bhai Lehna as his successor who was later named as Guru Angad and he was second Guru. Okay. He was the one who introduced Gurmukhi script. Okay. So, it was not Guru Nanak, it was Guru Lehna which uh, later named as Guru Angad Dev. Okay. And further, uh, Guru, if there is a question that who started the Langar, so answer would be Guru Nanak Dev Ji started the Langar, culture of Langar, Guru Ka Langar. But it was Guru Angad who popularized it and expanded the scope. Okay. So, first statement is incorrect. Now, the second statement says Adi Granth was installed, installed for the first time as holy book of the Sikhs by Guru Angad. Now, this is again an incorrect statement because it was fifth Guru, that is Guru Arjun Dev. Fine. Who, who is also credited uh, for building the Golden Temple in Amritsar. And uh, he was the one who uh, for the first time installed uh, the holy book of the Sikh, uh, that is Adi Granth. So, as you had to find the correct statement, both the statements are incorrect. So, answer would be D, that is neither one nor two. Okay. So, let's move on to the next question. Uh, which is based on this news, which featured on page number 6 of the Hindu newspaper. And as we discussed that uh, there is a tiger uh, who killed a woman recently. Now, forest officials have uh, are getting closure to uh, catch him. Fine. So, this is news regarding that and brief regarding that, that they are closing into and they are nearing to capture this tiger. So, as you know that uh, conservation reserves including National Park, Tiger Reserve have been important theme from the perspective of UPSC examination. As you can see here in 2019 itself, it has asked, uh, it has given you various uh, wildlife centuries, name of various wildlife century and tiger reserves and they asked you which among them were part of Agastha Malai Biosphere Reserve. So, we have taken up similar question. And we have asked that which among the following are part of first biosphere reserve. Now, you uh, might know that uh, you might be aware of the fact that first biosphere, res uh, biosphere reserve in India was Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. So, this question is about Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve of which Bandipur is also a part of. So, Bandipur, Bandipur basically was a private hunt space of the king of Mysore, the erstwhile uh, princely state of Mysore. And uh, along with several other, which we will see later, uh, um, uh, tiger reserves, it forms one of the largest contiguous protected zone okay, in India. So, you have to find uh, which among the following are part of this Nilgiri biosphere reserves. So, let us look uh, quickly look into the facts related to Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. So, Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve uh, is a reserve which is located in Nilgiri Mountains of the Western Ghats in southern India. Okay, it uh, extends in major. Uh, it extends into three states that is uh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala. Okay. And uh, which all are wildlife centuries or uh, protected areas which uh, constitute this Nilgiri Biosphere Reserves have been listed here that Muddu Malai National Park, 
Mukurti National Park, Satya Mangala Wildlife Century, these three are in the state of Tamil Nadu. While Nagarhol, Bandipur, both are in Karnataka. Okay. Silent Valley National Park, Aralam Wildlife Century, Venad Wildlife Century and Karim Puza Wildlife Century are in Kerala. All these combine to form Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. They are part of Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. Further, it was the first uh, uh, site to be declared under UNESCO's Man and Biosphere Program as Biosphere Reserve in India. It was year 1986. It was first Biosphere of uh, Reserve of India. And uh, another important fact related to Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve is the number of tribal groups like uh, Badagas, Toda, Kotas, Irula, Karumba, Panya, Adiyan, Idandan, Chetis, Alar and Malayan are native to this reserve. reserve. So from these names, you will understand that uh, our answer would be C, that is uh, Nagarhol, Bandipur, Aralam, Venad. Now I told you along with some others, so these uh, are Nagarhol, Bandipur, apart from that, Muddumalai, okay, these three, these three forms the largest contiguous protected zone, okay, the Nagarhol, Bandipur, Muddu Malai, these three form the and and uh, Venad. These four form the largest contiguous protected zone. Okay, so our answer would be C. So let's move on to the next question, which uh, which is inspired from this news article, which featured on the science page of the Hindu newspaper, and uh, it is about piezoelectricity and uh, related. They have explained what is it, what are its its uses. So we have taken up a question based on the piezoelectric effect uh, because UPSC keep asking question uh, keep asking questions from various scientific discoveries, laws, mechanism or uh, effects, etc. As you can see in 2018, they have asked a question based on general theory of relativity itself. Okay. So we have taken up a question based on piezoelectric effect and you have to identify the correct statements. So statement one says, it is ability of material to generate a magnetic field in response to an applied current. Fine. Second statement says, the effect can only be observed in metals. Now both the statements are incorrect. We will tell you why. The best example, the most common example that you can see uh, around you is a lighter. Okay. So, piezoelectricity is nothing but you will apply the mechanical stress. Okay. So, the mechanical stress or the mechanical force will be converted into electric current. And in lighters, what happens? There is an inflammable fluid uh, which is filled in the lighter. So, when you are applying mechanical stress, it will create an electric current. And due to that current, this fuel will ignite. And that's how lighter will work. Now another example that you can understand that you might have uh, witnessed that while uh, climbing up some ladders, you will find that lights are getting switched on when you are keeping your uh, legs on that particular step of the stair. So what you are doing, you are putting a pressure, mechanical pressure. Now this mechanical pressure is getting transformed into electric current and that is how the light is getting switched on. So this is a direct application of piezoelectric effect. There is an indirect effect also, where an electric current or electric uh, signal can be converted into a mechanical uh, wave or uh, mechanical stress. As you can see in use of your headphones, where an electric signal comes from your uh, connected device, it creates a vibration and you hear the so uh, song or sound, whatever it is, okay? So it is a reverse use of piezoelectricity, fine? So direct, you are putting mechanical stress and electric current is generated and the reverse process is reverse piezoelectric effect. Now, metals like quartz, ceramic, 
there are several uh, uh, material in general uh, which show which show response of or uh, effect of piezoelectric effect apart from that there are some uh, biological substance also like your bones your tendon muscles because of their complex structure they also create piezoelectric effect fine so both the statement are incorrect as it is saying that it generates a magnetic field in in response uh, to an applied current which is incorrect it creates an current in response to a mechanical stress second says only in metals which is also incorrect you can see it in biological substance also so both the statements are incorrect okay so the last question from the prelims perspective in today's session uh, is inspired from this news article which featured on page number 17 of uh, indian express newspaper and the context is that indian banks are uh, sitting on over 93000 crore approx of unsecured loans now what is unsecured loans you don't need a collateral to get the loan so the security behind these loans are null there is no security behind these loans okay because you are not giving any guarantee against the money you are taking up so this is uh, in crude terms you can understand these are the unsecured loans so indian banks are uh, sitting on over around 93000 crore of unsecured loan which are in special mention account category okay now these special mention accounts are almost 7% of the total unsecured loan which is a way bigger amount that uh, stands at around 13.32 lakh crore so total unsecured loan is around 13.32 crore lakh crore sorry while sorry <clears throat> the special mention account category constitute around 93000 crore okay so as you can see upsc always ask question related to mobilization of resources banking se uh, sector or uh, a overall economic prospect of the country as in 2018 they have asked the question specifically based on the role of the banks regarding the capital infusion okay so we have taken up a, an a mcq based on a special mention account so we will see both the statement together and then we will look into what is it what is it all about so you have to identify the correct statement statement one says sma were introduced by scheduled commercial banks to identify stressed asset in their balance sheet fine second statement says if the principal or interest payment is overdue for more than 90 days then the loan is categorized as sma now let's understand what is sma now there are stressed asset what is stressed as asset now bank is uh, just monitoring let's say uh, somebody name uh, x taken some amount of loan from bank now there is a principal amount now there is some interest due date is first of every month but now bank is observing that the person is not able to pay the interest or principal amount in time and both are getting delayed again and again and again now bank what what they will do they will categorize this that okay there is some kind of threat that this will become a a uh, non performing asset in future okay so there are two level of categorization the lower level is sma that is special mention and when it crosses some threshold it becomes npa okay so first thing that uh, first statement says it is introduced by scheduled commercial banks no it is introduced by rbi to identified incipient stress in the assets of bank and nbfcs these are the account that have not yet turned npas okay so the first level but rather these account can potentially become 
npa is in future if no suitable action is taken fine so what is sma uh, there are three subcategories sma0 sma1 and sma2 now if you are delaying the payment okay uh, so the first sma0 is principal or interest payment not overdue for more than 30 days okay there there is some delay but not more than 30 but account showing signs of incipient stresses okay now you can see that uh, balance is not being maintained okay there are frequent withdrawal okay balance is depleting so there are signs of stress but you are somehow able to manage to repay within 30 day of uh, the stipulated time now when it will go beyond 30 days and uh, before 60 days that is beyond one month but before two months it will be categorized as sma1 now if it is overdue beyond two months till three months it will be categorized as sma2 now if it goes beyond three months it will be categorized as npa that is not non performing assets okay so it again it will be substandard doubtful and lost so substandard is from 3 month to 1 year doubtful greater than 1 year now lost asset is the identify the bank or rbi but the amount has not been written off fully okay now even beyond 1 year great uh, a long time has been passed but uh, no recovery has been instituted and uh, this amount has not been written off wholly okay so as said the first statement is incorrect it was introduced by rbi now if the principal or interest is overdue for more than 90 days now you know that it will become npa and will not remain sma so this also uh, an incorrect statement so our answer would be d that is neither one nor two fine so that's all from the point of prelims discussion now let's move on to the mains discussion now this is the news which uh, we discussed that on constitution day celebration our president uh, murmu she again reiterated the call for all india judicial services okay so all india judicial services her argument is that with the schemes of reservation for various sections of population and interactive intervention of central government uh, those who are less represented in these services will get a representation adequate re representation or you may say the um, you may say that uh, fair representation so this is her demand why we have taken up this topic because uh, from your gs paper 2 perspective the judiciary is very well mentioned and uh, of lately there has been a tussle between the elected government and the supreme court and high courts regarding collegium system this is uh, another extension of that uh, debate and uh, issue between the government and uh, supreme court or the high court fine Further, if you know, uh, first understand what is uh, this all about? What is all India judicial services? Is it going to select the judges for High Court, Supreme Court, or it is going to se uh, select the judges for Munsif Court or CGM Court or District Court? What it is? So, as you know, India is a quasi federal state, have a three tier structure, unified uh, judiciary, Supreme Court at the top then the high court then uh, the subordinate courts okay so in subordinate courts there is a rank that is district judge we we generally call it district judge now this is a proposal for a centralized recruitment of these district judges okay we will understand it uh, more elaborately when we we will uh, go further in the discussion so where uh, when did this demand first 
comes from okay so first uh, uh, demand was if you can trace was in 1958 when 14th law commission recommended the institution of all india judicial services but at that point of time many of the high courts and many of the state governments retaliated why they retaliated we will discuss okay so many of them retaliated that this is an encroachment upon their power so it was shelved again it came into light uh, in the year 1976 when savarn singh committee again recommended formulation of all india judicial service and accordingly now this committee's recommendation were accepted and 42nd amendment act came into light through this 42nd amendment act article 312 which empowers the rajya sabha to create uh, to uh, provide a resolution for an all india service okay and because we are talking about a centralized system that is an all india judicial service so through this 42nd constitutional amendment article 312 was amended and what was added a sub clause 3 was added you can see here on the screen sub clause 3 here okay what does it say it says that the all india judicial service referred in the clause 1 shall not include any post inferior to that of district judge as defined in article 236 okay okay further article 312 sub clause 1 as it refers it also included including an all india judicial services so here are here there are two things first the all india judicial services was, uh, was added through an amendment second it it was made clear that it should be for the post of district judge and above because language is it shall not include any post inferior to that of district judge judge okay now keep this fact into your mind further if you will what supreme court has to say this is about the uh, law commission uh, referred to it and uh, kind of suggested for the creation of all india judicial services then uh, savarn singh committee said government enacted an amendment what supreme court has to say supreme court in 1993 in in the case named all india judges association versus union of india they said that government should take immediate steps to create an all india judicial service again in 2017 supreme court directed the government to uh, you may say again reinforced or reiterated the demand for creating aijs so this is funny isn't it government is uh, doing amendments to bring uh, all india judicial services supreme court is saying okay bring it as soon as possible then why this thing uh, is not uh, seeing light of the day why why we are unable to create an all india judicial service simple answer is as per the law ministry there is no consensus among stakeholders what kind of consensus so in this discussion we will be understanding all of those things that first at at which level at what level aijs is going to bring the change what is the present practice why we need aijs because there are some uh, drawbacks or challenges or lacuna in that present system that is why we uh, we need a new system so we will understand that also then what aijs will bring as a benefit to the present system we will look into that 
if there are benefits if there are merits uh, in aijs and everyone is on the same plank that government is saying okay we will bring amendment we will bring aijs supreme court is saying bring aijs then what are the challenges why why law ministry is saying that there is no consensus okay so we will look into the challenges pertaining to creation of aijs and uh, then we will briefly look into the way forward okay so let us begin our discussion by understanding what is the present status how things are being done at uh, sub uh, level of subordinate judiciary so at a state level you, you we just discussed that there are three levels supreme court high court and subordinate courts now at a state level there are two levels okay high court and district and session court judges so right now whenever you will hear that uh, there is the exam related to judiciary it is for the selection of judges for the munsef court and for the role of judicial magistrate okay and what is it now district and session court you know the uh, this is the post which we know as the district judge he handles he has both the power both civil and criminal side now this side represents the civil side and we say subordinate judges court the first level and the second level is now if if you will uh, go from top to up this uh, munsef court is the first level the entry level is munsef court then you will go to the subordinate judge court and they are different uh, based on the based on their pecuniary powers which is more clear on the criminal side okay uh, this is the side of criminal offenses okay so here the judicial magistrate handles the cases in which there is a punishment of up to 3 years while chief judicial magistrate that is C cgm handles cases which have pecuniary pro provisions of 7 years and more while district judge can award life sentence as well as death sentence also in similar fashion in civil side powers are different at entry level they are limited and at subordinate level they are uh, way more unlimited than when compared to munsef court okay so at present whatever is the recruitment procedure is being done for this level and this level and how it is done so again let's have a look at the constitution itself it says article 230 234 recruitment of person other than district judge that is other than this post article 234 says appointments of persons other than district judges to the judicial service of a state shall be made by the governor of the state in accordance with rules made by him in that behalf after consultation with state public service commission and with high court concerned so governor will decide that what would be the procedure to recruit the person as munsef judge or judicial magistrate in consultation with the high court and state public service commission and that is why you will hear that there is exam of judiciary okay so first is this provision now the problem is that it has left the matter to various state governments so the first concern the first challenge with present scheme of system is there is no uniformity every state has its own procedure its own nomenclature and its own jurisdiction uh, criteria so there is no uniformity the judicial uh, administration at this level does not reflect any kind of uniformity across the nation second since it is up to the state public service commission you might uh, have heard uh, that there are four five years 
and there will be no examination. So examination will be conducted at the span uh, at the gap of three, four, five years. So there is challenge of huge vacancy, and vacancy is according to law ministry data. Out of the total sanction strength at the subordinate level, which lies at around twenty five thousand in India, around nineteen thousand five hundred judges are there. So there is a clear cut vacancy of five thousand judges. Okay, so there is no uniformity because you have left it to the respective states, and there is no consistency. in maintaining the examination module or examinations are not being conducted every year so there is vacancy also now another issue is from this rank of judicial magistrate to mun uh, or munsif court uh, the promotion is very delayed and across the state it varies from 10 to 25 years it depends on various factors now just imagine if you are from a reputed uh, law college let's say national law school okay why would you like to join a service which will uh, take uh, which will take 10 to 25 years to get promoted to cgm or subordinate judge court when you are if you will practice in high court for 10 years you are eligible for a high court judge post why would a talented guy or a person who has studied from a reputed university or college will invest his or her time in preparing for these examination which are not being conducted on a regular basis leave alone the promotion so the third challenge in present system is lack of talent pool they are unable to attract the talented Uh, youngsters into them fine next is uh, so so these are the challenges regarding the present system okay there is vacancy there is the uh, no, uh, there is no uniformity and there is lack of attraction to the talented pool of youngsters they don't want to go into these services rather they prefer to practice in supreme court and high court because there is a better chance to be elevated as high court judge or supreme court judge after 10 years of practice even leave alone supreme court and uh, high court judge read this article 233 okay it says person who is not already in service of the union or the state shall only be eligible to appointed as district judge for not less uh, if he has been for not less than 7 years an advocate or pleader and is recommended by the high court for the appointment now you don't need to wait for 10 25 years to get promoted to cjm or to get promoted to district judge you just have to practice for 7 years and if you have good caliber and you if you have shown your talent high court will automatically pick you for the district judge post so why to waste time in preparation of examination then waiting for promotion it is easy to just practice for seven good years and you are eligible fine so these are some structural challenges now when you will centralize this uh, scheme when you will centralize this selection process what benefits it will come uh, it will come with first is it will come with uniformity okay there would be a single exam like uh, you civil service uh, civil services aspirants are giving upsc is conducting every year exam and all india pan india exam everyone is eligible everyone is uh, getting ranks and on the basis of ranks they are getting services and cadre and every year the there is a wrap up of a season kind of one year uh, process it is and next year process gets started so if this will come into picture then there will be an uni uh, an uniformity across the country because of the uniform selection procedure then because you are taking the examination of on a regular basis it will also help in solving vacancy issues okay fine
then if you will conduct uh, the examination for district judge post because this aijs is concerned with selection to the district judges so like in upsc if you will get the is service you will go to the states for sdm training for around 1 to 2 years at max then you will become cdo uh, if you will work in states like uttar pradesh or bihar and after 4 5 years of spending as an cdo and sdm you will be promoted to a dm of a district okay so in similar fashion somebody who is getting selected through this aijs will just spend 3 4 years in training as these Uh, judges are doing the work and he or she will be immediately promoted to the district judge they don't have to wait for 2025 so it will help in attracting the talented youngsters also because now they have a better career progression a better career option okay further what it will do the merits of the all india services that it will help in the national integration because there is a unified exam so a person from uh, uttar pradesh can be posted in uh, tamil nadu a person from tamil nadu can be posted in himachal pradesh or anywhere else so it will help in the national integration more intermingling of the population okay and this is the criteria this is one of the basic uh, you may say idea behind creating all india services also fine to intermix the culture and uh, let the youngster go to the different parts of the country okay so it will help in the in the national integration also okay another benefit is if there is an all india exam a centralized exam now certain states may be lacking the required number of uh, human resource okay uh, it may be because of many reasons it may be because of n number of reason maybe the population there is not that interested in the civil services or in uh, judicial services they are engaged in different or maybe there are some socio economic challenges which are uh, hampering their preparation uh, just a moment uh we can, we can take this doubt uh, at the end of the session sir district judge is very possible uh, powerful yes he is what is your doubt just send me your doubt i will answer it at the end of the session okay so there are states which lack the requis uh, required number of uh, the required set of human resources so a centralized recruitment will also solve that problem fine that it will miss uh, it will match the lacking of one state and another state the human resources present somewhere it will lift up the selected people and those state will get the required number of people now here are some clutches if we will talk about the vacancy now the first thing that we if there are so many benefits then what are the challenges there are some issues we will take them one by one in detail but just imagine upsc is conducting civil services examination okay is there no vacancy issue there still there is shortage of more than 2000 officers still more uh, still mo um, there is shortage of officers in army again the nda and cds exam is being conducted by upsc so the claim that center's intervention will improve the things does not hold any ground because vacancy is there there are 5000 vacancies but there are vacancies in the examination which uh, solely center is uh, taking care of further now center and supreme court has a role in the appointment of high court judges now there is around 30% vacancy in high court judges also so the very argument that en uh, enrollment of center or the role of center will come uh, does, uh, does the 
रोल रोल ऑफ सेंटर रोल ऑफ सेंटर विल ईज अप द थिंग्स इट विल इंप्रूव द थिंग नाउ दिस नोशन इज फ्लॉड बिकॉज वेर एवर सेंटर इज वर्किंग देर आर वैकेंसीज देर ऑल्सो ओके फाइन सो बिफोर मूविंग ऑन टू नाउ दीज आर द आर्ग्यूमेंट्स विच श्योरली यू कैन नॉट राइट एज सच अंटिल एंड अनलेस इट इज बैक्ड अप बाई सम इंपॉर्टेंट रिपोर्ट सो वी हैव टेकन अप सम चैलेंजेस दैट हैव बीन स्पेसिफिकली मैंशन इन द वन सिक्सटीन लॉ कमीशन रिपोर्ट बट बिफोर मूविंग ऑन टू दैट लेट एस लुक इन टू सम इंपॉर्टेंट की आर्टिकल्स ओके so as you have seen that article 3123 deals with the uh, district judges and it says that uh, it is applicable to the post up and above district judge okay now another important article which is again a challenge in creation of aigs is that uh, amendment this process requires an amendment now you know that there are three kinds of amendment one can be done through a simple majority like any legislative procedure another two uh, which fall in the purview of article 368 one of them requires a special majority and other one is uh, requires a special majority plus ratification by half of the state which uh, which is concerned with the federal matters fine so this comes into the first category it simply requires a simple majority but it is considered as an amendment because part 6 which deals with the state and chapter 6 of this uh, part deals with the appointment of judges in subordinate courts so we need to amend these two provisions and that's why amendment is required though it does not fall as written here would not be deemed to be amendment of the constitution for, for the purpose of article 368 okay so this is the first kind of amendment but amendment is required there article 233 as we discussed that uh, for not less than 7 years that is 7 year practice if you have done as an advocate you are eligible to be elected or elevated as a district judge and who does that high court uh, governor does that in consultation with high court okay <coughs> further uh, another uh, important uh, constitutional provision related to aijs is the entry 11a which was transferred from a state list to the concurrent list and matter is administration of justice further concurrent list entry 11a it talks about administration of justice constitution and organization of all courts except the supreme court and high court so it falls under concurrent list now while state list entry 65 talks about jurisdiction and powers of all court except the supreme court with respect to any of the matters of this list okay so these are the constitutional provision just uh, to have an understanding that uh, what all the matters that they deal with nothing to uh, rote learn here It, what is important is article 312 sub part 3 and 3124 and 233 okay now let's move on to the challenges one of the challenges we discussed that uh, if we are considering that these uh, central uh, the centrality of the selection process will solve the thing it is not going to solve the thing because there are vacancies there also what 160 uh, 116th law commission has to say the first issue is inadequate knowledge of regional language now someone will say that in upsc also uh, if you will get some uh, cadre which is not speaking your mother tongue then you are being trained for that language so what is new with this issue if you can train someone now there is a basic difference basic difference is that law interpretation of law requires a deeper understanding of the language and here we are talking about the district and session courts the and these codes often use vernacular language so you must 
have a good command over language to appreciate the ev evidences and pronounce the judgments. You cannot just get trained that you can speak up, you can understand, now you can pronounce the judgment. And this is also related to this particular point that UPSC selecting uh, executive and UPSC selecting judiciary. You cannot compare both. Why you cannot compare? Because civil servants have to uh, just execute what have been directed towards them. They have to implement something. Some scheme came, they, uh, it, it will be having a clear uh, charted uh, trajectory or uh, plan that this is how you should be implementing this scheme and you pay, uh, a civil servant has to just implement. But a judge has to read between the lines. It is all about interpretation. It is about reading those articles, taking out interpretation and that is how Article 21 evolved throughout. Because the same text is there, but interpretation is being uh, uh, widened day by day and it is bringing more and more things. So you cannot equate both the things and a strong command over regional language is a prerequisite. You cannot just train a person for 2-3 months and he or she will write a test and no, it, it will not work in the judicial work. Okay, The nature is altogether a different thing. So, these two points are clear. Another issue is promotion avenues. Now, just again refer to this figure. Okay. Now, you know that entry level is done by state services examination. Now, district judge, you are planning to bring AIJS second entry because this judicial magistrate and Monsef magistrate is going up the ladder and being promoted to district judge. So, one line is coming from uh, bottom. Okay. Then there is All India Services. You are bringing district judge from there. Okay. Then there are some appointments. Those advocates who are eligible and have practiced for seven years are also eligible to get elevated as district judge. So, there are three people who are vying for the same post. Okay, so the apprehension that many of the mm, association of these judges have expressed that if you will have an all India selection criteria and if you will have a direct entry at the post of district judges, it might hamper our promotion because the position will be captured by those who are being recruited centrally. Okay, and our promotion prospect will be diminished. So, this is recognized by 160th law commission okay it is not just any claim further as we see uh, as we saw there have been a stiff uh, opposition from a state government and respective high courts so again because now you know why we read this uh, constitutional provision we read this because chapter 6 part 6 chapter 6 of part 6 requires amendment but not in line, uh, cannot be uh, deemed as amendment by Article 368. So, a simple majority, no role of a state. While at present, the selection, the promotion, everything lies with the state and the state high court. So, you are snatching that away and without consulting the states altogether, you will bring a simple amendment and the law will stand amended. And there will be no role of the state government. So, stiff opposition by state governments and respective high courts. Okay. Further, now if in the selection process the executive will come, so law commission says that AIGS will bring a thin wedge of executives as the service will be brought under political control, the transfer, the posting and everything like that. Some other uh, consideration. As we discussed that it goes against the federalism as we discussed here and that is why high courts have power, uh, the governor has to cons uh, have to consult to the high courts before elevating someone or transferring someone or promoting someone. So, high courts will lose their power, the control they will lose and so is true with the state governments. They are altogether being subordinate. 
subordinated so it goes against federalism and you are bringing that amendment without their concurrence then it is as we discussed the merit that some states are lacking the required set of human resources so some states which have surplus human resource can fill in the position so because it will be an all india examination an all india competition what will happen the states which uh, which you will see that certain states are be um, are having more selection than other states in upsc also so this will start happening in aijs also because some states which are lacking human resource will uh, be will not be having their share of representation in the services okay further now recently njac was uh, declared null and void unconstitutional by supreme court on the pretext that uh, it is a violation of uh, uh, separation of power the independence of judiciary so now uh, we have seen the law commission has said that uh, upsc cannot conduct this examination and we need to find an alternative so it would be a challenge to formulate a commission an appointment commission uh, which satisfy the judiciary and also satisfy the executive so it will be very um, you you may say it will be a walk on a tight uh, on a tight rope because if judiciary feels that it is too much of executive in it they will declare it null and void and so is true with the executive if they will not let it go okay so these are the challenges related to the aijs that why it is not uh, being implemented and that's why law ministry says that uh, there is lack of consensus because everyone is having their own version their own apprehension and nobody wants to give away their power fine so what is the solution now solution if you will uh, you will just improve the, the this aijs that is all india judicial services is just a just one part of the entire scenario of yask okay subordinate judges are just one part of this entire scenario you have problems in collegium there are debates there are allegations there are uh, versions that uh, they are not transparent they have opaque mechanism judiciary is claiming that executive wants to interfere and the judiciary wants to take away the independence if we will talk about the infrastructure that is another hurdle infrastructure is not there just imagine picture of any district court in your native place it is filled with people people are uh, sitting in sitting outside uh, there are thousands of lo lawyers and petitioners who are just uh, roaming here and there hygiene is not there connectivity is not there so aijs is just one part of the total problem we need to have a holistic solution if we want a solution for aijs then yes we must address the issues that has been raised by 160th law commission but again this is not the panacea of the solution for judicial system altogether okay so i hope this topic is clear to you let's uh, move on to the next topic which is inspired from this news ayushman bharat and uh, it appeared on page number 6 of the hindu newspaper fine so news is about that ayushman bharat centers to be now called ayushman arogya mandir and uh, tagline would be arogyam paramam dhanam this would be the tagline so, so a few things are important from prelim, prelims perspective which is uh, which are related to the details and features of this scheme we will cover few details and uh, all the features of the schemes have been provided in the pdf you can refer to that pdf and uh, we will cover few details basic details as we all know this scheme is a 
ambitious scheme of central government which came in the year 2018 and it is in line with the vision of national health policy of 2017 now basically what it intends to do what it intends to do is uh, till now we have a fragmented approach regarding the health sector in india okay uh, we have a sectoral approach we uh, we are dealing with few things at one time few things at other at other time what this scheme tried to do to find a holistic solution of the problem altogether okay so this is a uh, an step to achieve the sdg3 that relates to health of the population so this is a, a step which is uh, which is covering plethora of uh, uh, which is uh, which is uh, which aims to address the issues at various level starting from the primary health centers till the secondary and tertiary health care okay for majority of population now it has two parts okay what is it the first part is the sub component of uh, ayushman bharat scheme is health and wellness centers the first part and the second part is pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana pmj so what is health and wellness center it is a network of around 1 lakh 50000 upgraded primary health care centers so how uh, what is their significance first is they are uh, they are addressing the accessibility issue second they are uh, first uh, point of contact for the rural committee or uh, community or the um, or people who are living in far far flung areas okay so it is addressing it is a upgraded version of primary health care it will address the maternal health issues child health issues and non communicable disease issues so it is first point of calls first port of call for the population while pmjy that is jan arogya yojana the most important feature is the amount that is 5 lakh per family per annum 5 lakh per family per annum now primary health care is addressed through health and wellness center this will cover the secondary and tertiary expenses okay so these are the main feature further detailed feature have been provided in the uh, pdf because reading them out would not be a good idea here so we will discuss the challenges in this these schemes and some way forwards okay further uh, the criteria the selection of families is based on the criteria from which are delineated in socio economic cost census of 2011 okay now these are some basics now just try to attempt this mcq practice mcq and uh, give your answer in the comment box okay these are based on the information that we have given take 30 seconds and try to give your answers in the comment box then i will discuss this now question says that uh, with reference to ayushman bharat pm jan arogya yojana pmj you have to consider these three statements and you have to find the correct answer okay now first statement says it will provide a cover of up to rupees 5 lakh per family per year for primary care health coverage only now this statement is incorrect because this is this coverage is for secondary and tertiary care okay not for primary care only 
second statement says the household the household included uh, are based on the deprivation and occupational criteria evolved by niti ayog now this statement is again incorrect because we saw that it is based on the socio economic caste census of 2011 okay now third statement says the pmj is fully funded by the government and cost of implementation is shared between central and state governments now this is a correct statement so your answer would be a that is only one because the premium amount is being uh, borne by the government you don't you don't need to contribute anything so it is fully funded by government but there is a share okay 60 40 for uh, most of the state for hilly state himalayan states and northeastern state the share is 90s to 10 okay so only one statement is correct so answer would be a fine now let's quickly look into the concerns related to ayushman bharat scheme or pmj okay so the first challenge is availability of health infrastructure now there are two issues rather i would use the word accessibility okay first is now who recommends that for a good uh, healthcare system to work uh, on its full capacity or efficiently we need to have three beds per thousand of the population at present india is having 1.6 beds nearly half of what is required okay second there is another issue of accessibility around 75% of the total infrastructure related to healthcare center is in the metro cities which with which are catering just 25% of the population metro cities i am talking i am not talking all urban centers 75% of health infrastructure is located in metro cities which are catering 25% of india's population while rest of the 25% is catering 75% of population so the accessibility issue is there so you are providing insurance cover you are providing the uh, amount for them to get treated well but uh, how how would you uh, how would you encash or use these features because you will not be having the beds you will not be having the hospitals all together second challenge is healthcare infrastructure the paucity of private healthcare now you know that uh, there is a portal named rohini full form is registry of hospitals in network of insurance okay now according to rohini portal only 3% because there are some criteria which have been led by the by this ayush ayushman bharat scheme now only 3% of the private hospitals are meeting those criteria okay and you will be amazed to know this next fact just club them out of total 18000 impaneled hospitals only 600 have the quality certification rest of impaneled which are all already impaneled are not having the quality certification so it's all about uh, it's all about the debate of quantity versus quality okay now you are giving money you are uh, scheme is good you are providing money you are addressing a very big issue but where do uh, they will go they are not having any hospital if they are having hospital then there is uh, no quality those hospitals are not meeting the basic criteria of uh, the scheme itself okay then there is issue which is related to the early starters or uh, the leading states because affluent states 
are performing way better than those state which are not uh, performing well economically okay for the obvious reason because they have the good infrastructure they have the good private hospitals they have the investment from private hospital chains so they are performing well and those who are lagging behind in economically on economic indic indicators are lagging behind altogether in performance related to this scheme also further there is no standardized treatment guidelines and protocols and what is happening it is compounding to additional challenges what are additional challenges additional challenges are fake patients and fake procedures now there are proxy patients and there there is a nexus between doctors and patients doctors are prescribing anything as a treatment so there is an issue of uh, fake treatment as well as issue of fake patients because there is no standardized treatment guidelines and protocols to be followed further the budgetary allocation for 2021 it was around 6400 crore which by any mean and the studies and uh, experts claimed that this amount was not at all sufficient for the 50 crore of the population so these are the challenges which are related to the uh, pradhan mantri ayushman bharat scheme now let us look into some way forward first is which is uh, which will be the bedrock or the foundation for other solution that incorporate health into concurrent list why why because out of total government expenditure 33% is being spent by center alone now if they are spending 33% uh all alone they must have uh, control over quality they must have control over protocols they must have control over the standard and standards of treatment okay so it should be uh, and i am saying that concurrent list that it should be uh, with the consensus of state and center what it will do more is at come bringing center will help in accessing evaluating and analyzing the data and real time data accessibility will help in streamlining the procedures it will help in analyzing the impact of the scheme all together okay and further course of a future course of action can be framed accordingly thirdly now we have seen that some states are doing bet better some states are not doing better better so center can curb this thing center can objectively uh, ob in an objective manner allocate the resources to various states okay so equitable distribution of resources between affluent and less prosperous states should be done and this can be done when you will bring center in this uh, into the scheme of things lastly there should be a robust mechanism for an uh, overview of the scheme of things there should be a continuous quality enhancement and accreditation uh, process okay so that uh, the hospitals uh, are being um, should be checked on a regular basis inspection should be there their quality rating should be there and uh, warning for those who are uh, indulging in mal practices all these things should be done to channelize the scheme in a proper direction now most important of all what niti ayog has highlighted is the missing middle okay and what is what is it now according to niti ayog the success of ayushman bharat scheme cannot be realized until the issue of missing middle is addressed and what is it it simply says that those this scheme will cover 
if you can make understand this with this example this uh, niti ayog says that uh, the lower strata this scheme is covering around 50% of the population the lowest 50% now the upper 20% constitute those who have bought the health insurance on their own who are working for some organization and they have got the health insurance whether it is the private organization or uh, government organization that constitute the 70% of the population now what about remaining 30% they don't have means to get benefit of such activities uh, such schemes plus they don't have awareness also so this 30% is termed as missing middle by niti ayog and niti ayog has said the success of this scheme will lie on the inclusion of this missing middle in india so these are the suggestions problems related to ayushman bharat scheme this will be uh, okay uh, uh, those who gave option a yes you are correct as we have seen uh, we will take some questions if there are any uh, you can ask your questions here uh is it possible no i i told you that uh that amendment is required however it will not be deemed uh, as an amendment under article 368 these amendments can be done through a simple majority like we uh, do the simple legislations in uh, parliament so that is why we also discuss that uh, challenges lies pertaining to the it goes against federalism and that is why there are stiff opposition from various state governments and respective high courts also because you are going to amend something uh, am am amend a matter in which state governments have a control so is true with the high courts and you are not consulting them you can whenever you you will want you will bring that aijs bill and you will pass it by simple majority though it is it will be pending for the judicial scrutiny through judicial review but you can uh, unilaterally pass these uh, amendments so yes amendment is required it will not be deemed as an, uh, as an amendment article under article 368 uh if you will ask uh, pm janthan uh, pm jan arogya yojana no you don't need but yes because the issues related to healthcare sector are more or less uh, matches the issues related to this particular scheme all these issues are there uh, are in the healthcare sector if you will take this example see the healthcare infrastructure is not there health infrastructure is low the accessibility issue is there then the additional challenges like uh, fake treatment false treatment out of pocket expenditure all these things these points can be used in your answer if a question comes from the health sector second you can very well quote this scheme in your uh, gs papers and when you will have a clear cut understanding about such schemes uh, you can easily answer prelims question as well as you can use them as a sub uh, substantiation in your gs answer also fine okay 
सो थैंक यू एवरी वन दैट्स ऑल फॉर टूडे सेशन स्टे ट्यून फॉर मोर सच अपडेट्स थैंक यू